Now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. Hello, everybody, and I would first and foremost love to welcome you to our Accelerate to Zero event on behalf of Plug and Play, uh, on behalf of Plug and Play Global. My name is Magang. I'm the Corporate Partnerships Manager in the Sustainability Team, and I'll be your host for today from South Africa. We're incredibly excited to have you today on our event. And we really look forward to sharing our showcases um, with respect to our different startups, as well as some exciting announcements from our corporations that we're doing work with in this mission to accelerate towards a net zero carbon future. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Matt Claxton, who's our Global Sustainability Director. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we'll be going through today, we're going to start off with some presentations around trends in decarbonization and innovation. We'll then go on to a really exciting panel doing a deeper dive into some decarbonization trends and work our startups are doing. That will be followed by a trend presentation again from Matt Claxton around the global plastic value chain. And then we'll also go into a panel around circularity within that region as well. And then we'll give you an exciting presentation as well around sustainable fashion followed again by a final panel from our, our startups within the sustainable fashion space. We'll also have a lot of exciting announcements for you around the work that we as Plug and Play are doing in the sustainability space and again in this mission to accelerate towards a zero carbon future. Now, without much further ado, let me hand over to our global director, Matt Claxton, to give it away in terms of our opening remarks. Matt, over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Claxton. I'm a Global Director of Sustainability at Plug and Play, and welcome to the Accelerate to Zero event. We're very honored for you, for you to be here with us and excited that you're going to hear from amazing startups as they present to you their solutions on how they're helping cities and companies all around the world achieve their carbon neutrality goals, their plastic waste uh, neutral goals, or become more sustainable when it comes to fashion. So before we get started with today's event, I just want to take you through a brief history about Plug and Play, our sustainability program, and some exciting announcements um, you know, before we get started with the main part of today's event. So for those of you who, who are new to our platform, Plug and Play has very humble beginnings. It st all started here in our CEO's uh, Persian rug store in Palo Alto, where he was selling rugs on the bottom floor and is renting office space to interesting companies on the top floor. Some of the early companies that came through his doors were ones like PayPal, Google, Logitech, and Dropbox. And not only did he come, they come through his doors, he helped them grow and he was early investors in those companies. And it's easy to say it worked out incredibly well for him. And he really caught that startup bug. So 14 years ago, he officially started Plug and Play where we originally just worked, um, operated like a WeWork where we're renting office space to startups. And then corporations started coming into the door saying, we'd love to meet the startups that are coming in here. And then they started saying, you know, we'd love to see these startups grow and accelerate their progress a little bit more. So now we're actually running these three functions in plug and play. So first off, we are still a VC firm. We do about 200 investments per year around the world, uh, predominantly in pre-seed, seed, seed and series A companies. Um, you're actually going to hear from a few portfolio companies today, and we'll be making some investment announcements as well throughout the program. Um, we run corporate innovation, um, or we do corporate innovation with over 500 organizations around the world, um, a good handful of which we are helping them with their sustainability journey. And lastly, we run accelerator programs 
One of the largest ones we run in plug and play today is with the Alliance and Plastic Waste. And I'll kind of get into that in a second. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we have been investing ever since, you know, say it's early days um, in his lucky building and it's worked out very well for us. So today, Plug and Play has over 2,000 startups in our portfolio and 22 unicorns. In fact, we gave birth to seven new unicorns this year alone, and we can't wait to see what the rest of this year has in store for us. And not only have we been investing in more and more companies, but we have been growing physically around the world. So today, Plug and Play has 38 offices around the world with a few more to come early next year. And please stay tuned for those announcements in the later session. Now, about plug and play sustainability. We formally started about two years ago in October 2019 when we launched our partnership with the Alliance and Plastic Waste. So, what the Alliance is, is a consortium of about 60 companies from all around the world and all across the plastics value chain that have each contributed into a collective fund with the mission of ending plastic waste around the world, or at least making a very significant dent in the overall issue. Now, these organizations are all coming together, sharing information and saying we really want to invest and do more in innovation when it comes to finding new solutions or new business models and tackling plastic waste in different parts of the world. And that's what we've been doing with them um, since our partnership started. So originally Plug and Play was running accelerator programs for the Alliance in Silicon Valley for North America, Paris for Europe, and Singapore for Southeast Asia. And a little bit about how that program works is we have been doing call for applications and sourcing startups from all around the world in these particular focus areas. So we looked for startups that were doing waste collection, advanced waste sorting, processing of plastic waste to turn it into the same thing of value good, uh, financial incentives for bringing plastic waste back, river pollution prevention to stop river or to stop plastic waste from going into the rivers and ultimately get into the oceans, uh, waste material exchange and traceability, which is connecting waste collectors with people who want to purchase waste material, and lastly, design of plastics to make it so they can truly get into the circular economy. Now, this program was so successful that the Alliance actually decided to double down its efforts with us. And we are now running programs across Silicon Valley, Paris, Singapore, and new ones in Shanghai, Sao Paulo, and Johannesburg. But plug and play sustainability isn't stopping there. We've been really aggressive to meet the demands of this changing climate. And so that's why we've decided to also launch programs in carbon neutrality and in sustainable fashion. And we've been doing this uh, for the better part of a year now, where we're helping companies such as Mars, BIC, ADB Ventures, Astra, Aptar Group, uh, British Telecom, and Westlake with their carbon neutrality journey, as well as helping or fashion companies become more sustainable. So ultimately we can help our overall um, environment move towards car either carbon neutral, plastic neutral, or more sustainable fashion. If you have any questions on any of these programs, please feel free to reach out to myself or a member of our team and we're more than happy to chat with you on how you can get involved and be part of this, um, these great programs. So I went through a little bit about how um, our accelerator programs work. So what we do is, as I mentioned, we bring in startups to our ecosystem and we actually narrow it down to a top 50 based around different focus areas. So as you're seeing on your screen here, this is an example of our N Plastic Waste San Paulo program. And so what we do is we shortlist the startups and we provide it to our panel of, of corporations that are acting as judges for these startups. So they review the startups, they narrow it down from a top 50 to a top 20, and then to a top 20, ultimately to a top 10 or 12. And those are the startups that ultimately would be part of our program. And so some of the initial success of the End Plastic Waste program with the Alliance of Plastic Waste has been, we have sourced thousands of startups from all around the world. We have accelerated 73 so far with 23 more currently being accelerated in Johannesburg and in Singapore. And from that, there has been at least 100 commercial pilots and POCs and over $49 million has been deployed into these startups from third-party investors, from the Alliance, from the Alliance members, uh, from grants, and even from plug and play itself. And so what you're seeing on the screen here is just some of a hand, some of the handful of Great partnerships have been formed as a result of these accelerator programs or a result of plug and play working with these different organizations on their sustainability goals. One of the newer partnerships that have been formed is between Circular, Total Energies, Recycle Technologies, and Innovate UK um, on tracking plastic waste 
through the value chain so it ultimately can end up with a chemical recycler. And another similar project is with um, Greenback, Nestle Mexico, and Inval, where they have now set up a, pro a plant in um, Mexico to do chemical recycling of plastic waste. But we're very excited that there's a lot more on the way and we'll be sure to announce those either during this session or in future events that we have. So lastly, Plug and Play is very much putting its money where its mouth is and we've been heavily investing in startups in the sustainability space. Uh, we've done about 22 investments in the last two years and we're not slowing down. Um, we want to do more and more. So if you're a startup that is looking for early stage funding and that you're helping, um, you know, by tackling plastic waste or helping organizations go carbon neutral or making fashion more sustainable, we'd love to hear from you because there's a chance we might want to also invest in you and help you with your journey. And lastly, I just want to say there will be more sustainability hubs to come. Right now, there are currently six but we're planning on launching a few more and we'll be making announcements a little later in today's event. So thank you all so much for your time. I'm going to pass it over to our MC for today, Bakong, who is from our Johannesburg hub. And if you'd like to get involved, please feel free to reach out to myself and, you know, or a member of our team. And we'd love to hear from you and figure it out because that's what today's session is all about. We want to show you some of the emerging trends that are happening when it comes to going carbon neutral in the plastics industry, carbon neutral overall, and in the fashion space, for you to hear from exciting startups, and for you to see how there's different ways that you can work with startups on your sustainability journey. And we want to remove as many hurdles and barriers as there possibly is. And all it takes is for you to just reach out to us and let us have that initial conversation with you. Now, please enjoy the rest of today's event. You'll be hearing from me a little bit later. And Lastly, pass it back over to Bacon. Thank you, Matt, for setting the context for why we're here today and also sharing a little bit more about what we do at Plug and Play. Right now, you'll see a poll come up. So if you're interested in getting involved in the work we do, like Matt said, please click yes on the poll and we'll be sure to reach out. But now, without much further ado, let's get on to the content of today. Up next, we have Clotilda from our sustainability team in Paris, and she's going to be taking us through an impactful presentation around global trends in carbon. Please welcome Clotilda. Hello, everyone. My name is Clotilde Benro, and I'm part of Plug and Play Sustainability Ventures team based in Paris. Today, I'll give you a short overview of some trends that we're observing in the decarbonization innovation landscape and highlight some solutions that we're excited about to help reach net zero emissions. So in response to the urgency for action to act on climate change, we've really seen an explosion in the number of startups working on decarbonization solutions. And as part of some market research that we've done with the plug and play sustainability team, We've analyzed more than 500 startups in our ecosystem working on decarbonization solutions across six regions, 11 different decarbonization technologies, and 14 industries to give an overview of the growth, location, and stages of startups in each sector, as well as provide some key insights and highlight ex exciting startups. This is an ongoing market analysis where we keep adding more innovative startups to our database and our analysis as we go on. You can see on this chart on the slide the cumulative number of startups that we analyzed in our ecosystem since 2010 that are working on a wide range of technologies and decarbonization from data analytic solutions to circular economy, CCUS, that is carbon capture, utilization and storage, new materials, carbon offsets or hydrogen solutions. And I really want to point out an interesting statistic is that from 2013 to 2019, investment in what we call climate tech increased by more than 3,750% from 418 million to more than 16 billion in 2019. This is an enormous and impressive growth rate in the space and corresponds to around three times the growth rate of VC investment in AI technologies during the same time period. So what are some of the factors that are driving this wave of innovation and investment in climate tech? First of all, an increasingly supportive regulatory environment. 70% of the global economy is now committed to net zero emissions. 
Then there's also growing corporate commitments to, net, to reach net zero, where more than one fifth of the world's largest 2000 public companies have now committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. On the consumer side, there's also growing consumer demand for sustainability, which is connected to the fact that climate change effects are now tangible and affect our daily lives as well as have real economic impacts. Coming back to the financial side of things, uh, demand from public markets and institutional investors for ESG has doubled in the past five years. And then finally, uh, technology innovations and cost declines have driven down the cost of renewables, giving us cheap and abundant renewable electricity. And we're also seeing those climate tech companies scaling up and becoming unicorns. So unicorns are private companies with a valuation over $1 billion, and they don't include companies post-exit or companies that were acquired. And as you can see on this chart, as of August 2021, there were more than 25 climate tech unicorns who've raised over 18 billion in funding. So I will now focus on highlighting some uh, key trends across three decarbonization sectors, which connect to the startups that you'll hear from later in the panel discussion. So first, we'll talk about CCUS, carbon capture, utilization and storage, uh, with Herloom in the panel later. Then we'll talk about hydrogen with Anthea Energy, speaking about hydrogen, and then finally concrete and cement with Ferno Materials. So starting with CCUS, we really see CCUS startups as having a key role to play in reaching net zero emissions by actually removing carbon from the atmosphere and generating those negative emissions. So while CCUS solutions don't replace emissions reductions in existing industrial processes, for example, given the urgency of climate change, negative emissions will be essential to reaching net zero and mitigating uh, the physical impacts of climate change. So we've reviewed over 74 startups in the space, and as shown here in this graph representing the cumulative number of startups working on CCUS solutions since 2010, we found that there were three main categories of startups. Those that deploy carbon capture at the point source or at concentrated emission sources such as power plants. Then there's direct air capture or DAC startups capturing CO2 from the ambient air such as Herloom that you'll hear from later. And then finally, there is uh, startups that are producing useful products out of the carbon, kept, of, out of the carbon that's captured or the um, carbon to value companies. And we've seen that industry agnostic solutions dominate as a lot of these technologies can be applied across industries. We also saw that North American startups dominate this landscape representing around 57% of all the startups reviewed, then followed by Europe. And overall, in terms of funding raise, these companies that we reviewed raised over $1 billion. Now moving on to hydrogen. So the development of the hydrogen economy is really widely seen as a key enabler of decarbonization of the hard to decarbonize sectors, such as industry or heavy duty transport, like shipping and trucking. So sectors that are less suited for electrification or again, long duration energy storage. And currently there are three colors of hydrogen. The first color is gray hydrogen, that's fossil fuel based. Then we have blue hydrogen, which is fossil fuel generated, but with emissions capture. And then finally, we have green hydrogen that's made from water electrolysis powered with renewable electricity. And we really expect to see significant cost declines in green hydrogen production in the future. However, there are still uh, remaining challenges that are associated with the transportation of hydrogen due to its very low energy density and the overall lack of hydrogen transportation infrastructure. But in, in really interesting innovations are emerging, such as energy storage via energy carriers, such as ammonia, especially in the long duration energy storage sector, or there's also innovations for transporting hydrogen. And we'll hear more from Anthea Energy later in the panel and their solution to boost green hydrogen production. And finally, on the concrete and cement side of things. Uh, so concrete is the world's most utilized construction material and demand really keeps growing globally. Uh, cement, which is the binding material in the concrete, whilst it only makes up around 12% of the volume of concrete, it's almost exclusively responsible for those concrete-associated emissions. 
So there are opportunities uh, to reduce emissions that are emerging in this space via, for example, innovating on cement materials, switching energy sources, uh, emissions capture, or transformation of cement and concrete manufacturing towards more efficient and modular plants. And we'll hear more from fernal materials later in the panel about this. And opportunities for innovation in concrete also go beyond going with like lower emissions and lower greenhouse gases uh, to actually net negative emissions and capturing CO2 in cement or concrete materials manufacturing. So thanks a lot for your attention. And now I'll hand it over to Nicholas, who will introduce our panel. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Clotilda. Up next, as you mentioned, we have a carbon-focused panel discussion. But before that, we have some incredibly exciting news we want to share with you pertaining to our recent investment in the startup space. We are happy as plug and play to announce that we have invested in two more startups, namely Heirloom and Unless Collective. This for us is really important as we're really committed to this, uh, to this investment space, especially within sustainability. So we really look forward to the performance of those, of those investments and hopefully we've discovered two more unicorns. But anyway, back to our next panel, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Nick, and he's going to have a deeper dive or deeper conversation with some startups. And they are going to be Ryan from Antilla Energy, Gurinda from Ferno Materials, and Shashnak from Heirloom. Over to you, Nicholas. Um, all right, so first off, thank you guys for taking the time. Super excited to speak with all of you. Uh, we're going to jump right into things with a round of introductions and a few sentences about your company. So if you can just give a, a, a few uh, phrases here, we'll, we'll start left to right from my screen. So Gurinder, if you want to jump in and uh, introduce yourself, that'd be great. Cool. So uh, I'm Gurinder, um, currently CEO and founder of uh, Phono Materials uh, based in, in the Bay Area. Uh, and so uh, the premise of Phono, so we kind of believe that the future of cement or cement manufacturing is uh, going to be agile, modular, and scalable. Um, and so what we're doing is essentially designing a solution that's uh, more energy efficient, uh, has a pathway to being carbon neutral, uh, produces the same ordinary Portland cement, um, and is also adaptable such that it can enter and exit markets quickly and efficiently. So um, the way that we're doing that is essentially redesigning the cement plant. So all the way from the preheater to the pre-calciner, um, kiln to the cooler. So instead of it being like four separate units, we're kind of combining it into one unit that can enter and exit markets quickly and efficiently. Amazing, amazing. And if you could just maybe share a little bit about, you know, who your ideal customer is, how, how do you work with, yeah. with large corporations? That'd be great. Sure. So, I mean, we're still kind of fairly early stages at the moment. So we're kind of at the early stages of uh, building out our, uh, our pilot at around the one to two ton per day type scale. Um, and so what we're kind of looking for in terms of a partner at this stage is really, I mean, ideally it would be a uh, cement producer or some company that's willing to kind of help us come to market. Um, so ideally we have a situation where we're producing, you know, clinker and you have a customer or a couple of customers that can kind of validate um, the, the chemistry of the clinker, give us feedback, and then we can iterate on our product uh, likewise to essentially um, to essentially hit the metrics that are required. And, and I mean, that's kind of one part of the partnership. The other would be obviously helping us come into market. So that would be kind of the ideal partnership we're looking for right now. All right, perfect. Well, we're excited to have you here. Uh, we're going to move to Shashank if you want to go next. Yeah, I'm Shashank Samala. I am the CEO of Heirloom. Uh, we are a carbon removal company. Specifically, we're a direct air capture company that removes carbon dioxide out of the air, um, out of the atmospheric concentrations. So um, we, we, we use something called carbon mineralization, which is essentially um, low cost rocks like carbonates that are highly thirsty for CO2 in the air um, that we speed up 
um, to the carbonation cycle for, and then we end up creating a low cost, highly permanent uh, carbon removal system. Perfect. And can you also share a little bit about like who your ideal customers are? Maybe uh, highlight some partnerships that you're already working with right now. Yeah, we we announced uh, quite a, a few partnerships. Um, uh, one is with you know, Stripe and Shopify and, uh, and and a few other folks that we're yet to announce. So you know they buy offtake from us. They buy carbon removals. It's very simple. Um, why are they doing it? Um, because that's because they want to accelerate their path to get to net zero. Um, and they realize that number one thing that they need to do is decarbonize their, their, their operations, um, which is you know, moving, to, um, moving their primary energy generation from fossil to, to electricity, um, having uh, their fleet uh, electrify, um, doing all of those. And also that there's, there's sort of a re residual emissions and hard to abate emissions that they found, which you know, for Microsoft, for example, come out to about 30 or 40% of all emissions. And if they wanna be, get to net zero quickly, um, they need to offset it. And you know, instead of buying sort of traditional carbon offsets um, you know, for five to 10 bucks a ton where you know, you're uh, planting trees or whatever, um, which have many drawbacks, like you know, they're temporary, um, they're buying car permanent carbon removals um, uh, from folks like us. So it's, the partnership looks very, very, very simple. It's, you know, they just have a forward contract to buy carbon offtake from us um, and, uh, and, and, and that goes into their accounting. Perfect, thanks, Shazam. Um, next, we'll move to Ryan for a quick intro. You wanna jump yeah. in? I'm Ryan, uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Antlant Energy. We're building the world's first green hydrogen credit marketplace. And to do that, we're working with the consortium of partners that exist in the space. So project developers, especially, but also asset owners, utilities, uh, incumbent consumers of gray hydrogen, uh, new consumers, you know, early adopters of green hydrogen. We're bringing them all to the same table to have the same conversation about, you know, what is actually green hydrogen and how do we get to the point where we can start decoupling the environmental attributes from green hydrogen and trading it across our platform to the early adopters. So. Um, a long story short, you, you can imagine you have places where it's cheap to make green hydrogen, but usually that place is not co-located with early demand. Um, we work with our project developers to decouple that environmental attribute and share it across our platform with, you know, an early adopter that maybe is in Washington State or, or you know, Wisconsin. Um, and then, you know, make sure that we have radically transparent carbon accounting for the whole thing and, uh, you know, ultimately retire the, the credit. Um, you know, we want to make sure that there's real additionality here. So we're translating early adoption into new projects and pushing out, you know, methane from incumbent industries uh, by doing that. Um, so, you know, in terms of what an ideal customer uh, looks like for us, we're, we're also very early stage. We have a handful of, of partners that we're working with right now on the strategic side. Um, anybody that is interested in paying the premium for green hydrogen, and it's about $2 a kilogram right now on top of whatever you would pay for gray hydrogen, um, it's a turnkey process. You don't have to change or modify your existing industrial process in any way. If you buy green hydrogen credits from us, we can show you on the other end of this where a new project, a new electrolyzer got built and we pushed methane out of an incumbent uh, process. So um, we make it as easy as possible for our partners to get involved with green hydrogen. And we work directly with project developers to you know, get that off the ground. Okay, perfect. Thank you guys. Well, Really, really excited. I mean, there's obviously a mix of different solutions here. Um, where I'm gonna actually go back to Gurinder from the start. Um, what would you say to some of the cement producers to move earlier in the adoption curve and, and why is it important to adopt now? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, cement has kind of been around for a long time and there's a reason, right? And um, like these companies basically operate on like huge scales. Um, there's a kind of, reason for why they don't really want to change uh, too much uh, like right like if, if, if you're a cement producer like you put so much like capital into your existing infrastructure there is there is obviously like a reason there to not um, or, 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 or essentially be hesitant to change however like when you kind of see the ground moving with you know a bunch of uh, carbon regulations coming in uh, developed economies and then you have this kind of mismatch between supply and demand in 
developing markets where the majority of growth is going to be over the next 20, 30 years, um, you kind of have to uh, think about, okay, like is the current business model, the way that we're producing cement plants, uh, the way of the future? And this is kind of where startups come in. So the kind of key advantage that a startup has over a you know large company, and it's really the only key advantage, it's that you can iterate on different business models and technologies much faster than uh, the, the traditional players. Um, and so if I was kind of a cement producer and I was trying to bet on the future and I see like one of my main weaknesses is like the ability to change and adapt to uh, uh, a, a, a changing environment, like I would probably be want to be, I would probably want to diversify my risk by putting some bets on a few key startups uh, that have different, uh, I guess, views on the world and where the uh, industry is going. Um, and I think we kind of offer that uh, differentiated kind of view of where where cement is uh, is going. Nice. Well, it's it's certainly a place that we need innovation. So uh, I'm I'm really excited to, to follow you guys' journey. Uh, Thanks. We move to Shashank next. Uh, why is it important to buy permanent carbon carbon removal? Yeah. So traditionally. There is many companies that claim that they were net zero um, because they were, um, you know, Google, for example, there's many companies that early on that sort of net claim uh, net zero by essentially buying carbon offsets that um, didn't have a few things. Uh, one, additionality, uh, essentially, you know, additionality basically means that if you didn't fund a project like a forest project that you wouldn't have otherwise have happened. Um, and recent research so, shows that there's about 85% of the projects um, didn't have additionality, meaning those would have happened anyway. And the fact that claiming these carbon offsets um, and, and allowing you to continue to pollute um, because you're claiming those offsets um, essentially is it's not being additive. Um, so you know if you're going to, if you're going to buy carbon offsets, like they better be. Uh, additional and they wouldn't have otherwise happened. Um, it's the other one is is uh, what, what you mentioned permanence. Um, uh, forests, as we know, have uh, have a very long cycle of being, getting from you know uh, seedling all the way to a fully grown tree and and being able to sequester a lot of carbon. Um, and it, it take de decades. And then during that time frame. Um, there is high risk of decomposition. As we all know, there's also fire risk of putting the carbon back into the air. Um, and, and then there's many other risks around uh, permanence of carbon and sort of traditional nature-based options, um, one of them being forests, and there's other ones like uh, sequestering carbon in soils. Um, so you know what we're doing is uh, ensuring that when we remove carbon out of the air, it's permanently removed and it's, you're not pushing the bucket in the future. Um, so what our technology does, for example, um, is move carbon out of the air and 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 sequester that CO2 um, underground um, where, where it came from, really, and under safe storage uh, under a cap rock or essentially um, mineralization underground as well, where you're sending the CO2 uh, and, and turning it into stone uh, within, within a couple of years. So you know it's permanently sequestered away for thousands of years, um, and you don't have to worry about. Um, and and the other uh, the other thing that you get from permanent carbon removal is quantification and verification. Uh, and many times with nature-based solutions, you don't have uh, an idea of, of how much carbon you actually sequestered. So you can build many models uh, to understand you know uh, how how tall is the tree and sort of um, you know even you know a lot of these nature-based systems are. Uh, are, are living systems, right? Like they're they're respiring carbon, they're and they're absorbing carbon. So it's um, you know even the best models can really actually verify that you've actually sequestered uh, a good amount of carbon. In this case, when we when we capture the CO two and and before we put it on the ground, we literally weigh it. Like you 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 know exactly how much CO two you captured. Um, so quantification, traceability, per permanence, a lot of great things that happen uh, with with these types of more engineered, more technological solutions. Um, so, and I, I'd like to just have a follow-up question to you. Um, and I think when it comes to permanent in, in the director of carbon capture, I mean, I think those two things are synonymous, which is great. 
Um, one of the criticisms is obviously the scalability. How are you guys thinking at Heirloom about scalability? Sure. So fundamentally, and you know, very similar to Gurinder, there, we, we're thinking about how do we build modular systems that are fundamentally uh, low cost and, and have a path with a, with a very fast learning curve. And, and there are a bunch of things that happen when you have you know, modularity. Um, as Gurinder mentioned, it allows fast iteration between design to design, it allows you to iterate quickly, um, refine your design, and also helps you to essentially mass manufacture these, these devices. Um, you know, the, the first solar panels that came off the, um, the, the line were a thousand times more expensive than they are today. The first iPhones that came out of the line were a thousand times more expensive then that you came out like the iPhone, for example, is an incredibly complex device, but the modularity of it allows you to really build an automated factory around and, and be able to manufacture just you know millions and millions of these devices. And it's very similar to directory capture. Um, at the beginning, the first the first modules that um, we call them contactors uh, that come off the line will be expensive, but once we um, essentially you know built millions of these modules to to distribute and, and put anywhere, everywhere across the world to capture the CO2, um, it brings down the cost and also makes, makes it fundamentally scalable. Um, and the nice thing you know, about CO2 in the atmosphere is, you know, uh, if capturing CO2 out of the atmosphere is you're not locked to a power plant or um, a, a point source capture device. It's, you know, it's 400 PPM in this room, it's 400 PPM where you are uh, watching this. Um, it's it's similar concentration everywhere. And, and so you can really build technology that is standardized um, because you're dealing with the same concentration here um, and, and uh, everywhere across the world. So it allows you to be standardized and modular at the same time. So. Great, All right. I, I, love, I love that answer. Thanks for the details there. I'm gonna move to Ryan. Um, Ryan, you know, from my view, hydrogen technology is still pretty nascent. It's evolving, there's a lot of money going into it. Uh, what's interesting is that your marketplace approach, it touches a lot of parts of the value chain. I'm curious, how do you see this hydrogen space evolving and how does that impact a marketplace like yours? Yeah, I definitely uh, agree with the, the rapid evolution of the space. I mean, you know, hydrogen, the, the technology of electrolysis has been around for 250 years. So it's, it's pretty well mature at this point, but there are still you know, advances being made on, on the hard tech side of things. Um, I think what's really driving at this time is that the oil majors are, are being pushed out of hydrocarbons. You know, they, they have activist board members all of a sudden saying, you know, you have to decarbonize by this date. And so um, what do they know how to do? They know how to make, store, pump, move, market gases. And so they're really excited about hydrogen. Um, and I think that's, that's gonna be a major driver this time. So, you know, I, I expect we'll see the market um, grow, whether it should grow or not. I personally think it should, but I, I, you know, there's gonna be, more money behind this hype than we would see in, in other um, technologies. I guess what one of the main challenges that is going to persist is the storage and distribution of the material. Hydrogen is notoriously difficult to, to store um, and you know, move through a pipeline. There are a handful of utilities right now. Uh, SoCal Gas is, is doing a very good job of this right now. Um, but trying to figure out how do you move hydrogen through an existing pipeline? And the problem is, is that uh, hydrogen can embrittle materials. It can, you know, uh, corrode you know, or, or cause decay of your your bow rings and, and other types of your gaskets. That um, there's a lot of retrofitting that needs to be done. I don't see the transmission distribution problem getting fixed anytime soon. Um, so absent a marketplace design like the one that we're building, uh, where you make it where you need it and then transfer the credit virtually. Uh, it's going to be incredibly expensive to get it off the ground. So I think that's why what we're building is uh, interesting and, and hopefully will accelerate the, the rate of adoption of green hydrogen across the board. Um, it really helps drive down the cost quickly and it makes green hydrogen accessible to almost anybody anywhere. Uh, as long as you have access to gray hydrogen, we can make the projects happen on the other side. So yeah, I think that's the, the major challenge is, is overcoming the transmission distribution side of it. Great, uh, amazing. I think the accessibility is, is fantastic. And, and obviously the driving cost down is obviously an extra bonus. Um, yeah, I think from, from our side, I think we have a, a few minutes left here. So just gonna have a, a question that all of you guys can answer. Uh, and we'll, we'll go back to Gurinder. Um, what excites you the most about climate tech kind of broadly uh, when you look at the space over the next two, three years? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of just uh, excited in general. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I think uh, 
Yeah. Heavy industry is super exciting. Um, I mean, for me anyway, I, I think like, you know, with a startup, you, I mean, you start with like some sort of an idea uh, that's trying to solve some need or gap in the market. And, uh, you know, you come out there with a potential solution and you're kind of trying to see it to reality. Um, what's kind of unique in this situation is like, uh, what we're trying to change or influence is literally like like things like cement, uh, steel, or like shipping in like the heavy industry uh, sector. It's like those things are like the foundation of modern society. Like like we wouldn't have the population, like the countries, uh, and 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 the wealth and the prosperity that we have now without those pillars. And like the potential for impact is just huge. So. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm just excited in general. <laughs> yeah, and as am I, as am I, for sure. Uh, Shashank, same question to you. Yeah, actually, I would echo that. Um, you're, we, we built a whole entire economy on fossil, right? Uh, yeah, I think Gurinder is exactly right. Like, we wouldn't have this type of population if oil never, if fossil was, was never around. Um, and you know, fossil is and and um, fossil is used in literally every part of the economy, like chemicals production. Like if you're watching this in a laptop or a TV, like the plastics, the wires, the um, every part of the uh, you know ecosystem economy is built on fossil. So essentially, what you're doing is you're fundamentally retooling the entire economy uh, with climate tech. So in in many ways, when you think about what software did, for example, the last few decades, it's literally found itself to you know, the fabric of entire society. Um, you know, it's become the interface between humans and, and how we interact with the physical world. And now I think the physical world itself is being re-architected and retooled because that was built on fossil. And, you know, how we produce steel and cement and, and how we fly, how we, um, yeah, how we ship things, how we grow food, how we, um, you know, make fertilizer to grow food like the, every part of the supply chain is going to be um eaten uh if you will by climate tech uh it's not just sort of uh you know a, a sector that you can sort of put you know tuck away and invest um in um you know it's not like, like a cyber security we want to invest in cyber like no it's it's going to be in every part of the uh economy so every fortune primary company every you know, corporate will need to think about how they can, um, you know, sort of sure net zero commitments are fine, but uh, fundamentally, it's like in in the new world of where where carbon itself is um, is 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 being taxed or it's being, um, you know, that's going to be main focus over the next few decades. So it's like how you have to think about how you fundamentally rearchitect your corporation to to lead the, the charge or, and, and be a pioneer in, in that movement. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'm, uh, we're, all, we're all on the same page of hoping that, that climate tech follows that same momentum and the same path as, as software. Um, and, and Ryan, I'm gonna have the same question to you to wrap us up. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I've been involved with climate and before that I did environmental work for more than a decade now. And what's exciting all of a sudden is that there are two things coming together at the same time. The first is a proper accounting of externalities where you know the true value of environmental services and ecosystem services and the true value of uh, manufacturing or shipping or whatever is, is finally being accounted for. And we're putting a real number on the price tag behind this and we're understanding these systems at a much larger level. Um, and I think that it's, um, it'll lead to uh, appropriate pricing, uh, hopefully, and, and hopefully some some government, um, you know, uh, support of that pricing. And then the other piece is the talent entering the sector. So it's been lonely in clean tech, we called it for a long time, uh, climate tech, you know, it, it was a bunch of, uh, you know, lab nerds hanging out and, and doing research and trying to improve ecosystems or, or you know, improve efficiencies. But um, all of a sudden you have folks coming in from banking, you have folks coming in from, from uh, software, you know, uh, a good friend of mine, his company just uh, hired the you know, one of the lead data scientists from Google. Uh, you know, you have these, there's this call to action um, and it's a cultural movement all of a sudden. That's exciting for me seeing all of these people that are walking away from these otherwise, you know, pretty secure jobs to get involved with climate and making a difference. So yeah, those two, those are, yeah, appropriate accounting of externalities um, and a growing talent pool. Yeah, well, we're equally excited about the growing talent pool as well. And, and 
and we know we just need more people like like you guys focusing on this challenge. Um, that that's really it. That that's time. It was fantastic, and I know I could talk to you guys, you know, all day. I just want to say thank you also for dedicating your guys' focus on this mission. It's obviously super important, and uh, and we want to to encourage also everyone else to focus on this mission. But Grinder, Shafank, Ryan, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I encourage everyone that is listening in, if, if they want to learn more and get connected, then uh, feel free to reach out and we're happy to make those email intros. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Great. Bye now. Thank you, Nick, and to the panel for such an incredible discussion. As Dick mentioned, if you'd like to connect with any of our startups on that panel, please click yes on the poll now, and we'll be sure to make that introduction for you. And now moving on to our next, our next section of the event, we're going to move over to plastics. And with that, I'm going to hand back over to my colleague, Matt Claxton, who's going to give us an overview of plastic trends globally. Over to you, Matt. Hello again, everyone. So I just want to spend the next seven to 10 minutes with you, kind of showing you some of the amazing trends that we've been seeing from startups in the plastics value chain all around the world. And part of this is a result of the work we've been doing with the Alliance on Plastic Waste over the last two years. So together with the Alliance, um, the Plug and Play Ventures team has been sourcing and scouting startups from all around the world and all across the plastics value chain. And we've been also doing call for applications where startups have been able to apply to be part of the accelerator program. We've broken this down by region, by sector of the value, plastics value chain, and then lastly, the age and stage of these companies and the types of end use markets that a handful of them play into. From there, we've been able to see really interesting trends emerge. So what you're seeing on this graph here is the volume of startups compared to how old they are. Um, so starting from the top with the most amount of startups in this space is bio-based and uh, biodegradable material companies, followed by mechanical recycling, waste collection, chemical recycling, reusables, consumer education, traceability, waste sorting, design and additives, cleanup, material exchange, and then lastly, biological recycling. So even though you know, some of these, there doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of startups, some of these are actually a very exciting and emerging trends that we've been seeing. We wanna share a little bit of insights with you so you can take this information and possibly work with some of the startups in that space to see how you can get involved or how you can partner with them or even invest into them. So the five trends we've been seeing in the space is in biological recycling and chemical recycling, which has been a very difficult part. And we won't touch a lot on that today, but if you have more questions on chemical recycling, I'm more than happy to have a one-on-one -on -one with you. Then design and additives, materials exchange, which is connecting waste collectors with people that wanna purchase a waste material and transform it into something of value good. And then lastly, waste sorting. So from, let's start with design additives. So what we mean by this is design a plastic to make it easier to recycle or um, so it uses less plastic or so it uses more uh, sustainable materials to create that same types of properties of the original type of plastic. Um, the additives side of that is additives that can be applied to, you know, again, a more sustainable form of plastic that have increased um, properties. So you don't have to use um, ones that have higher carbon emissions or ones that can't be recycled. So we've seen some pretty exciting startups emerge in this space. Um, today we have about 51 exciting startups um, from around the world, mainly coming out of Europe, following North America, then China, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Africa. I'd say the ones that are doing the design work, and these are companies that are doing chemical R&D using AI, um, are in the one that side of the stage from series A, B, C, and D. And these are companies like Keybotics and Citrine Informatics that have raised, raised very large seed rounds or series A's. And the ones in the additive side are more in that pre-seed seed and series A side. And that's because it does take a little bit more time. There's a lot more lab work, a lot more R&D work. Um, they usually get by on grants for you know, the first few years. And then once they get to a certain scale, that's when they start working with different corporations. Uh, but the, the material that they're able to create is vastly important for boosting up the entire value chain and helping it really become a circular economy and also reducing the carbon emissions 
of these plastics when they are manufactured. So when it comes to material exchange, this is a little bit of a newer one um, that we've been seeing. This is really that marketplace between waste collectors and the people who want to purchase the waste material and transform it into something of value good. We've seen more and more fashion companies, automotive companies, um, different types of textile companies, different types of manufacturing companies saying, we want to utilize waste material into our products, but we don't know how to get that different types of waste plastic that's out there. So this is where these digital types of um, companies have emerged where they're saying we have these types of plastics with these colors, with these volumes from these different regions that we have worked with different collectors in those areas to categorize and gather together. And then we can sell them to the people who want to purchase this waste material and utilize it for their final end products. So even though it doesn't look like these startups have raised a lot of money or not going into later stages, they're actually growing very well organically and are getting by by helping, you know, get more and more of these plastic waste into, you know, future products and really create that circular economy. So these types of companies are really crucial. And you're actually going to hear some exciting announcements about these types of companies in the next two months. Following that, and companies that are very similar to these that are doing pretty similar work to material, material exchange companies are traceability startups. So these are companies like Circular that are doing plastic uh, traceability through the value chain. So where it's going from manufacturing to ultimately the end use customer and then the landfill where they can see where are their gaps, where is the plastic ultimately ending up? How do we get it from the landfill or from the roads or from the you know, streets, wherever it may be, and get it into the hands of the people who want to take that plastic waste and process it? Um, one of the exciting partnerships that we've been seeing in this space emerge has been between Circular, Total Energies, Recycle Technologies, and Innovate UK. We want to give a big shout out to that group for the amazing work that they've been doing and pioneering that type of partnership and that type of pilot. And we can't wait to see the full results. And most importantly, we can't wait to see more companies like that get involved and do that similar type of work. So when it comes to advanced waste sorting, this is one where there haven't been a ton of startups in this space, but the ones that are in this space are really heavy hitters. And these are companies like Amp Robotics, which has raised so far over $75 million um, or Gray Pair or Recycleye, where they're utilizing machine learning and computer vision to analyze the different types of materials that are coming down the line on the MERS and then using robotic arms to quickly pick off that plastic waste from the line so it can be properly gathered together and then sold to processors that can then transform that plastic waste into something of value good. Now, where we've been seeing these interesting startups is mainly out of Europe, followed by North America, Southeast Asia, China, and Africa. And there still needs to be a lot of work done in helping boost up startups that are coming out of Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, and China, because they're not quite getting the attention they deserve. Um, so if you are a waste management company in those areas, please feel free to reach out to us. We know a lot of great startups there that are struggling to get attention from the right different parties. Um, but it's been amazing to see these, these startups coming out of Europe and North America, their journey and the impact that they've been able to have by helping get more plastic waste back into their circular economy and away from the landfill. So I know I didn't have mechanical recycling on my um, initial slide, but the one thing I do want to say about this is, yes, there are a lot of startups that are out there in this space, uh, but they do play a key role in helping make plastics become more sustainable and truly create that circular economy. And the way they're able to do this is they can take plastic that chemical recyclers may not be able to take and say, we can take that plastic waste and prevent virgin building materials from being made and instead take that plastic material and utilize it to be, to create commercial roofing material, building blocks and roads. And you know we've had some really exciting startups such as Up Upcycling, Arclight and Biofusion that are doing just that with different partners in and outside of the Alliance. And if you're interested in learning more about those companies or the great case studies that they've had um, with those organizations, please check out our website or feel free to reach out to us and we're more than happy to send you their information. So when it comes to chemical recycling, as I mentioned, this is one of the more difficult areas of the plastics value chain. There's been a lot of time, money, energy put into it and it's because once you're able to solve this, especially at scale, it really opens up the door in taking 
in moving the plastics into a true circular economy. Um, so I won't really get into this. This is much more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And if you're looking to see or hear what are the advancements in chemical recycling, where are the, some of the exciting startups, where are some of the emerging trends that we've been seeing, you know, why do you see so many, why do we see so many startups out of Europe and North America, but not so many out of China, Africa, or Latin America, then we're more than happy to have that conversation with you. So please feel free to reach out. And the last one I wanted to mention is in biological recycling, or sometimes referred to as enzymatic breakdown. Now, as you can see, not a lot of startups in that space um, over the last 10 years. Most of them have been formed in the last two or three years, and they've been creating really exciting products and really exciting business models. Um, so these are companies like Carbios or Melozyme, which I've raised very large funding rounds. Carbios is actually that one that's in the Series D. And some of these other ones have been able to raise um, actually very large seed rounds or um, Series A rounds and are doing incredible work on the way they're able to break down plastic waste and turn it into crucial building blocks for future products. Um, again, if you're interested in learning more about these types of companies or would like to see you know, these different ones uh, from Plug and Play, please feel free to reach out and more than happy to connect you with those types of companies. So thank you all so much for your time. Um, we just wanna sh share with you some of the interesting trends I've been able to see by reviewing all these different startups there's more and more trends, as I mentioned, that we didn't go over. So if you'd like to learn more or hear from, about this trend presentation, please feel free to reach out to myself or a member of our team, and we're more than happy to go over this with you. And again, we thank you for your time, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you, Matt, for that brilliant contextualization for our next startup panel. So now we're actually going to get to talk to three amazing startups who are working and active in the plastics value chain space. And I'm going to introduce Heidi from Biofusion, Vera from Circular, and Svanika from Repurpose Global. Over to you guys. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we're very excited to be featuring three amazing startups that are working with different cities and corporations all around the world um, to help them go either plastic neutral or help with their carbon neutrality journey. Um, so I wanna to spend today hearing from the three of you about the work that you're doing, your startups, and how you can help different organizations um, around the world reach their sustainability goals and some of the exciting announcements or achievements that you have, um, and maybe some of the hurdles they've overcome. So with that, I'd like to pass it over first to Heidi, if you'd like to introduce yourself and Biofusion. Great. Thank you, Matt. And thanks for, thanks for inviting us to join the chat today. I'm excited to be here and learn about these amazing uh, other companies uh, that I get to work with. Um, I'm Heidi Kajawa. I am the CEO and founder of Biofusion. Uh, we have developed a service, a solution that uh, enables cities and corporations to take control of their waste, their plastic waste, and convert it into a uh, alternative building material that can help to reduce the dependency on some of the virgin building materials out on the market that are a little bit more uh, uh, carbon intensive. Um, and uh, I'm excited to talk more about the details of what we're doing uh, with some cities uh, later in the conversation. And Svanika? Uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Svanika Balasubramanian. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO at Repurpose Global. Uh, we are the world's first plastic credit platform. Um, so really thinking about how we can learn from the carbon credit market, learn from kind of its weaknesses and strengths and build on that, apply it to plastic and see how we can unlock private sector funding for solutions that could combat uh, the plastic crisis. And we do this primarily through the plastic neutral certification, where we work with organizations, perhaps such as yourself, to measure your plastic footprint, help you reduce it where possible, and then help you fund the removal of an equivalent amount from the ecosystem around the world um, through plastic credit projects across three continents. Um, and of course, diving into a little bit more about that later, but glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Vera from Circular. Hi, Matthew, and thank you for the invite. Um, I'm Vera Johnson, co-founder of Circular. We are a traceability as a service business. And by that, what I mean is that we enable our clients 
to trace the provenance of raw materials in their manufacturing and recycling supply chains uh, globally. And as part of that traceability, clients are able to track the carbon emission footprint of their end products, whether it's plastics, whether it's leather, whether it's a battery in a, in an EV. And that includes Scope 1 Direct, Scope 2 Bought In and Scope 3 Inherited, which then allows clients to make informed decisions about responsible sourcing and responsible and ethical recycling. And I guess we'll touch a lot more when we get into the, um, the discussion. Yeah. So I'm really excited for the three of you to be speaking today. Um, before today, you've actually not met at all. The only common link really was working with Plug and Play and myself over the last six months, year, two years. Um, and I think there's a lot of fantastic things that you guys are doing and a lot of great overlap uh, between your organizations. And so I'd like to kind of narrow it down a little bit more um, and maybe Heidi, I'll, I'll pass it off to you to go first and then please, everyone else jump in. Um, how have you been working with different cities and corporations on their zero waste initiatives? And also, you know, how has it also been able to impact their carbon neutrality goals as well? Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a great, it's a really good question. I, um, you know, from a city's perspective, I think we'll start there. I think there's definitely been a different dialogue that residents are having with their, with their local government leaders lately around plastic waste. In particular, I mean, clearly, plastic waste, we hear about it all the time. Um, it's a very impassioned topic. Uh, a lot of people really care about it, um, which is why you're seeing new, re like, reg new regulations, et cetera. It, but if you break it down, I mean, plastic waste, the, the whole problem is it's pretty complex. Um, and uh, it's complex for cities to deal with it, it's a complex environmental issue, um, it's a complex material. Um, which is why we struggle to, it's why there's all kinds of different types of plastic, which compounds the, the environmental impact that we've seen. So what, you know, what our solution really does is it enables a, a different a cities to handle this, this environmental crisis in a much different way and satisfy some of the needs that the residents are wanting to get involved and see real big transparent change around this particular material. Um, even the waste management companies struggle with the stuff that's not recyclable. Of course, we've got very strong processes and supply chains around recycled plastic. The PETs and the water bottles and a lot of the single use have a very high value and there's lots of very strong supply chains associated with that material. But there's a lot of plastic that's not a lot of films and flex packaging and all of the new innovative things that we see in the, in the packaging space. So it's just a very complex problem um, that uh, you know everybody's trying to solve. So uh, the way that we're we're getting much more contact from from council members directly, trying to looking to us to help them solve their problems. Yes, they've got their curbside recycling. Their MRFs are struggling, and some in some communities, a lot of communities don't even have curbside recycling that they're trying to they're trying to figure out a way to deal with it because they have stress on their landfills and it's just this you know very complex ecosystem that cities deal with it's a, it's a much different thing so um, our solution really helps them plug that gap so to speak take control of their plastic waste create a commodity product that can be used to help um, uh, help them keep up with the demand of their city infrastructure projects and parks and recreation and creating open spaces and and really put people to work. I think that's the thing that's most exciting about it. Um, it. Not only does it solve for their help to accelerate their plastic waste and achieve zero waste goals, but it also helps to reduce um, the carbon emissions um, that are entailed typically in construction. A lot of building materials are imported in to regions and cities all over the place. Um, and so if you're building a material out of the waste that serves the local community, you're reducing a lot of the logistics um, that re are required to move that kind of material around. So there's a lot of added be benefits across the board. And yeah, I love, so, I love that I like to talk about traceability as one of the underpinning foundations that's needed to be able to unpack that complexity of the supply chain. What we're finding with some of the clients that we're dealing with, so for example, um, we're working with um, Sky and Innovate UK as part of a project to, tr to provide traceability of the, um, the recycled use of ocean plastics. And as part of that, the challenge that we're 
are trying to address is that the value chain for recycled plastics doesn't really justify all of the participants and equally um, handling the payment of pickers all the way through to building trust in the recycled content of the product, whether it's a consumer product or um, you know, whether it's going back into a recycled plastic use. I don't know if you're finding that as well, um, Svanika. Yeah, I think I was just thinking as as uh, you both were talking, really, I think like um, what, what we're trying to do is essentially kind of like give solutions like Circular and kind of like uh, by Fusion, the platform to kind of like go out there. Because it, it, I think when you're looking around the world, so right now um, we do plastic credit projects in, in uh, South America, in North America, in Africa and in Asia. And then people think it's all very different. It is. It is very different for the most part. Um, but the need oftentimes ends up being the same. You do need good traces everywhere you do need ways to kind of deal with your unrecyclables I mean yes your recyclable plastic can go get recycled but what are you going to do with your MLP and your flexibles and kind of your LVP and so on um, and I think that the big gap everywhere is just that everybody knows the right solutions everybody knows that that, that we need to fund the circulars and we need to fund the bifusions um, it's just that who does it who, who kind of like puts the funding into it. Um, and I think I really see that's where plastic credits can come in um, and then say, well, it is not kind of like an intrinsically kind of a profitable thing to, to deal with unrecyclable plastic waste, um, the way you think about kind of recyclable plastic waste. Or uh, Vera, as we were kind of talking about just a bit earlier, um, traceability is such a important need, um, especially when you're dealing with the global south, where you have a huge informal economy, where about the majority, about 90% of your recycling actually gets done in an unregulated manner. And then so you really need to kind of have good practices in place. You're not having child labor, um, you're not having kind of like, you know, you're having gender equality and so on. And a lot of this, I think, is tied together by just good funding, good, stable, holistic funding. Um, and I think that's kind of like where plastic credits can come in and help as well. Um, and, and that's also, I think, where we touched on a little bit about kind of working with cities, but perhaps that's where working with companies can come in too, um, where you have a lot of the, the private sector, uh, whether it's CPG brands out there, whoever it is out there, everybody has a plastic footprint. Um, and then so kind of uh, financing the responsibility of that plastic footprint probably involves financing traceability and financing kind of like uh, the, the unrecyclable kind of collection and so on as well. Yeah, and just picking up on your point about carbon neutrality, the, the whole debate about um, mapping the supply chain so you have that genuine transparency so that you actually understand the total impact of the entire chain from end to finished product. We're, we're starting to see a much more focused debate and discussion, particularly in the midstream and the whole debate about carbon offsetting once they've actually got that picture and how logistics actually plays a huge part in carbon emission tracking, yes. particularly the, um, the biggest culprit in terms of you know, where the real issues are. For example, we've just started to work with, um, from a cities and supply chain perspective, just started to work with um, British Vault, which is going to be European's largest gigafactory. And they've got this bold ambition that they want to start all the way from the beginning. And it combines, Heidi, what you were talking about as well, recycled green materials all the way through the construction phase, but actually the impact that the factory and the construction of it is going to have on the local community, um, both in terms of sourcing of materials, impact on labor, impact on local businesses, but also impacts on the carbon emission footprint as vehicles come into the site, which was a whole new level of traceability that we had not expected to start so soon. No, that's a really good point. I mean, construction debris is one of the, was, is another, big culprit when it comes to landfill airspace consumption. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that's that's one thing that we've we've talked very closely about, <clears throat> excuse me, as we as we've developed our platform too, is what happens after our block is after we're done. I mean, what happens after we put it in a wall? What happens next? Um, we've we've been very mindful throughout our process and development about that particular pr pr uh, problem because of the construction debris too. And I don't think people realize like there's still there's still stuff that happens once you build something, right? People remodel it, things change, they fall down, you know, there's natural disasters, there's things that happen. And so one thing that um we've been that we've done to think forward in our product is we have a reusable product. So you can build, you know, a structure today and then take it apart next year and build something else. I mean it's a it's a reusable product. 
Um, and then if there's any if there's any offcuts or things that fall off on our product, we just sweep them up and send it back to us and we throw it in the machine. I mean, it's there's we can help to combat some of that zero waste challenges on the construction side too, which again, traceability is about traceability across the board. Absolutely. It's interesting that I mean, I've been quite fortunate that whilst I am from London, I've had the opportunity to be based out um, on the West Coast US North America's for the last couple of months. And the narrative is very, very different from a European perspective and the US perspective. The US is much more focused around resource resilience, resource security, resource reuse, and supply chain transparency. Whereas in Europe, which is much more driven through regulation, it's much more about supply chain sustainability and secondary use and circular economy. And it's just been fascinating the touch points from the impacts that we're going to have on cities, but also the impacts on local economies, it's becoming much more prevalent. I don't know if that's something that you both are noticing differences in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, sorry, Heidi, you were just going, sorry, I think there's a little bit of a lag on my end. No, please go ahead. Um, no, I was going. I was going to say. I think what you're really starting to see, um, whether it is cities, I think like um, we do. We do see kind of like in plastic. Uh, you you do have the difference between kind of like Europe and, and the US all the time, right? I think um, historically uh, the EU and Europe has been miles ahead. I would say um, when it comes to a lot of the regulatory markets and kind of like what, what needs to be done um, compared to the US. I mean, even something small like EPR regulations, right? Extended producer responsibility um, and untoxing the producers of the the pollution so to speak um, and then using that putting that funding to work kind of like sat with the EU and then so because those regulations exist the way brands respond to that the way companies kind of like think about their own responsibility um, is very different from like say a US where there are no regulatory markets and a lot of it is kind of like driven by voluntary markets and you're doing it out of your own accord and so how people think about how companies think about responsibility um, is quite different um, and it comes from a different place um, and I think a lot of it is driven by by the consumer momentum, I would say. Um, and I think, uh, Heidi, you touched on this in the beginning about kind of like how a lot of cities were changing practices because of consumer momentum. And I think we're definitely seeing that in, in the business side of things as well, where you have so many people coming today and saying, well, I do need to take do something about the plastic in my packaging, my plastic footprint, or I'm going to lose customers. Um, the, the millennials and the Gen Zs of the world um, are not going to kind of want to, to work with uh, companies that are not really Really being uh, holistically sustainable so I think it is um, it is a lot of it I think ties together and, and a lot of it I think comes because of that you know transcendent mo movement that you're seeing um, uh, in the in the public eye as well and I am hoping uh, that 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 starts to kind of like standardize a little bit because um, it does become so much more simpler if you're not thinking about kind of EU regulation separately and the US separately but rather it's one planet and you know you're, you're putting plastic out there and all kind of like congregates in common areas and then so having some sort of uh, holistic framework to address it will be really, really useful. I certainly think some of the conversations we're having with state departments and um, you know, the federal organizations around traceability and the impact traceability can actually achieve on you know, recycling plastics or recycling materials, it's actually going to become more of a topic of legislation in, in the US as well. And certainly, as you pointed out, that um, Europe is a little bit further ahead in terms of using regulation to drive change. And certainly from what we're seeing with the German supply chain laws, a lot of the companies are now realizing that next year, they're going to have to start to put in place traceability systems, whether it's plastics recycling, whether it's materials traceability, but being able to prove that they know where their materials are coming from and that human um, rights have not been infringed. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. And sometimes you so see you see all of these um, brands coming out. So when when brands go plastic neutral, one of the things that we kind of like encourage them is well, neutrality is the first step, right? You're kind of like taking responsibility, but you want to go ahead into reduction and redesign and kind of incorporating recycled materials and so on. And you see all of these big commitments being made um, by all of the, the big brands out there, right? By 2050, we're going to be completely using 100% PCR, um, or by 2030, it's going to be kind of like 50% PCR. 
PCR and in 50% recyclable materials. Um, and then you just got to stop and think, well, where is all the material going to come from? Um, you need good supply chains and you need good traceable supply chains um, to, to get that material to meet the commitments that are being made. And to a large extent, the commitments that are being made today do not have enough backup, do not have enough supply to meet the kind of demand that is coming in. And then, so I think that traceability component also becomes very central over there because um, you don't want to just use plastic that that is apparently recycled you want plastic that that you can certifiably say came from uh you know the ocean or, or the landfill or you know i know where it came from so i think that that's um more and more necessary as these commitments become more and more prevalent absolutely totally agree with that we are, i have a funny example i often talk about you can't change what you don't know and what and i won't name the client one of our clients wanted the proof that um the material the cobalt the amount of cobalt recycled cobalt going into their batteries was at least 20 percent recycled so we put the supply chain together we did the um, traceability piece and we were able to prove that it was always 100 percent virgin cobalt material and the reason being there aren't enough recycled batteries Right. be able to deliver as you set out that that is from a recycled supply chain source therefore the demand is coming but the supply isn't there yeah and we're going to see that across the board i think um especially with all of the new le le legislation around pcr um uh, on the plastic side i mean we can't we're not doing a good job on the capture side now right so how are we gonna how are we gonna achieve some of those so there's regulations right now. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how that unfolds. So I, I hate to jump in here, actually. We're almost out of time. This conversation has been flying by. Um, but in the last minute and a half, um, I'd love to just pass off to each one of you. What is your take at home takeaway message uh, for the audience? Um, and we'll be sharing all your contact information um, immediately after this fireside chat so they can get in touch with you. But just 30 seconds, what's your takeaway message for the audience at home? Uh, maybe Vera, since I know you're about to speak, I can pass it off to you first. Sure. I think I think my message will be that we need more pioneer clients who are willing to trial te new technologies to be able to deliver genuine traceability to hit some of the topic points that each of us have talked about today. Great. Um, Heidi? I think for me, I, I um, you know, I think especially with this, our solution coming to market and some of the things that we're doing in the States right now with some of the big, big cities, emerging cities, growing cities, I should say, um, it's, we, it's your waste. I mean, it's, I think that now more than ever, like we have to remember, like when you buy something that, that package that that thing comes in is yours, you know, and in the past, you didn't really have options, what you could do with it. But now with our solution, you do, you'll, you'll have a choice, you know, it's your, it's your waste, it's your choice, keep talking about it. Um, and uh, let's, let's push the accountability back down to the people who buy it, right? Hmm. Great. And then last but not least, yeah. Yeah, I get the last word. <laughs> um, uh, I think I think to echo a little bit of what Avera and Heidi were talking about, I think what I would really say um, is that progress today, even if imperfect, um, is much better than a perfect roadmap for like something 10 years down the line. Um, and I think that applies to both plastic, that applies to carbon, that applies to really any sustainability measure that, that we're talking about, um, where it's better to kind of like take that imperfect step today and then start creating change and start creating kind of real tangible impact on the ground. Um, and, and then then kind of plan towards all of the other initiatives rather than saying well 10 years down the line i'm going to you know this is my commitment um uh, and, and and i think the world can't afford um to wait until those perfect roadmaps become a reality uh so i would just say take action today um whether that's plastic neutrality net zero carbon neutrality whatever works uh for your company yeah and i, I love that last little part we cannot afford to wait any longer so for all of you at home Please, if you want to get involved or work with any of these amazing startups and these wonderful founders, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to them or feel free to reach out to Plug and Play and we're more than happy to connect to you. And again, to the three of you, thank you so much for not only being part of this presentation and part of this event, but also for all the great work that you're doing because you are the innovators and problem solvers that are helping make our world a better place. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. 
Well, you heard it from the panel. Thank you so much, Svanika, Heidi, and Vera for those amazing insights. As we've done before, if you'd like to get in touch with any one of our panelists, please indicate yes on the poll that's coming up right now. So what we're gonna do next, we're going to have a little five minute break for you guys to re-energize. But before that, I have a great announcement for you. And this is about an incredible program that launched between the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, one of our key partners at Plug and Play, and a Silicon Valley batch one startup, Literati. So six months ago, they launched the Clean for Change initiative, marking a commitment from all the AEPW member companies to start using the Literati app to collect and map plastic waste all over the world. And to date, we've had thousands of people, dozens of organizations coming together for this great initiative. And for us, that really exemplifies the impactful nature of the startup and corporation collaboration that we promote at Plug and Play. So this is your opportunity. If you'd like to get involved in this initiative with our partners and our startup, please let us know and we'll get that going for you. But now, as I promised, Let's now take a quick five minute break to energize, get some coffee, whatever you need to do, and we'll be back with another panel afterwards. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed your break. I certainly did. So now it's time to kick off the last part of our event. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alexandra Pine. She's one of our ventures analysts in the Silicon Valley office, and she's going to talk to us about decarbonization efforts within the fashion industry. Over to you, Alexandra. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexandra, and I'm a ventures analyst at Plug and Play, working in new materials and sustainability. I'm so excited to join you today to talk about the carbon impact of the fashion industry and highlight some trends that are helping this space to decarbonize. Up to 10% of global CO2 emissions come from the fashion industry. According to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, current greenhouse gas emissions from textile production already stand at 1.2 billion tons annually and could account for more than a quarter of all global CO2 emissions by 2050. In order to reduce the environmental impact of the fashion industry, we need to take a look at the full supply chain and entire life cycle of textiles. But there are a few sectors that stand out when it comes to carbon, those being bio-based materials, upcycled materials, transparency, and digitalization. We'd like to note that there's an information void in regards to total environmental impact of textiles due to a lack of in-depth research into the whole system. That being said, in the next few minutes, you'll hear some insights that we have gathered based on an analysis of the startups that we have in our ecosystem. The first sector that we'll take a look at is bio-based materials. Bio-based and biosynthetic materials are those that are manufactured from living matter and can replace current textiles on the market. These alternative materials include cellulose from the agricultural industry, as well as microorganisms that create different fibers, fabrics, and leather. One challenge in this space is maintaining the properties and scalability offered by petroleum-based products while keeping the cost competitive, which is why we see fewer startups at the Series A stage. It's estimated that about 63% of all textiles are derived from petrochemicals, all releasing a considerable amount of CO2. So finding new solutions would help this area decrease carbon emissions. From the timeline below, we see there's a huge increase in this space starting in 2015 due to an increase in awareness and consumer involvement. Most of the startups are based in Europe and that's due to the regulations and government grants in the space in those regions. Developing materials from regenerative agriculture provides the fashion industry with an opportunity to impact the environment in a positive way through carbon sequestration. Saltico is one startup that's utilizing this method of farming and creating natural fibers by sourcing plants from diverse healing spaces, such as wetlands that sequester and store large amounts of carbon. The next sector we'll look at is upcycled materials. The fashion industry is one of the first ones to look toward other value chains and their challenges when it comes to innovation. Upcycled materials includes fibers produced from waste, such as plastic, agriculture, and industrial waste, as well as CO2 emissions. 
The amount of startups has almost doubled in the past two years, again, due to the demand for alternative feedstocks and search for waste management solutions. There's a little more of an even distribution when it comes to the region, possibly because of the relevance of the waste problem in all regions and the potential to repurpose it into fiber. We do see more startups moving past the seed stage here. Most commonly, those are ones that are working with plastic upcycling due to the comparable properties to current um, fibers. When it comes to carbon, some startups are going above and beyond to reduce their impact by actually capturing and repurposing those emissions into textiles. One startup doing this is Azola, which found that the creation of a polyester t-shirt releases 12 pounds of CO2, whereas producing a shirt from upcycled carbon emissions actually captures 1.5 pounds. Transparency is the next sector, and this includes software technologies that allow for improved sourcing and traceability throughout the supply chain. Demands for increased visibility and upcycling of materials can be met using technologies such as RFID and QR codes that enable traceability. Enabling traceability of fibers will allow for more efficient recycling of garments that are made of different materials, which is not always apparent from their tags. Initial solutions include platforms that promote sustainable suppliers and increase visibility throughout the supply chain. Change will be difficult and there, until there's a real understanding of the whole impact of textiles. A survey of retailers from 2019 found that 75% were unaware of the source of their fabrics and only 50% could trace where their garments were cut and sewn. Compared to some of the hardware sectors, we see more investment in this space due to the faster scalability of the software-based companies. This is seen by the slightly higher percentage of startups going past the Series A round. Data on sustainability can be made more available through collaborations such as that between Pangaea and the startup Eon, which is creating digital passports for clothing that can provide consumers with real-time information about a garment's carbon footprint and its carbon offset. And lastly, we'll look at digitalization. New digital technologies are increasing circularity and decreasing waste in the fashion industry by targeting inventory and production challenges. The large amount of startups in this sector demonstrates the early need for digital technologies and customization for change. 3D imaging and sizing softwares are helping to reduce return rates, therefore decreasing emissions and energy costs associated with excess transportation. There are also several companies working on digital prototyping and virtual fashion, where there's no physical garment, eliminating factors like materials, manufacturing, transportation, and waste. With the new generation and the importance of online presence, the virtual market is growing fast. We again see a higher percentage of startups growing past the seed stage since they're largely software-based, and we also see that they're mostly concentrated in the US and in Europe. The virtual fashion startup DressX found that the virtual clothing has potential to use 97% less CO2. DressX is actually joining us today alongside Zeismi and Retrace to further discuss the carbon footprint of this industry and how their companies can help. Thank you, Alexander, for those incredible insights, as well as that brilliant segue into our next panel discussion that's going to be moderated by Danae Roberts. She's our Ventures Associate as well in Silicon Valley, and she'll be joined, as mentioned, by Lucas from Retraced, Olga from DressX, and Bobby from Zeisme. Take it away, guys. Let's hear what you have to say. Hi everyone, thank you so much for your time today. I'm here with Olga, Bobby, and Lucas. Thank you again for your time. Um, we're gonna be discussing carbon emissions in uh, relations with digital fashion. So maybe Olga, you can start. Olga is the Chief Sustainability Officer at DressX. And DressX is one of the first digital or virtual fashion clothing. So you're really reinventing consumption. Um, I'll let you introduce your, yourself and maybe if you can include also how your company decrease overall carbon emissions. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to talk today about the carbon emission. Yeah, my name is Olga Chernyshev and I'm a Chief Sustainability Officer at DressX. 
what we are doing in Dressex is that we are the largest retailer of the digital fashion. And what does it mean is that we provide the digital uh, garments on the digital garments to our clients. You can buy from us a fitted photo look when you submit your photo uh, and you select the garment and within 30, 32 hours, you well, 20, 24 hours, sorry, you receive your photo back with a, a new photo look where you are dressing a new garment, digital garment. The second uh, solution what we provide is the app. We have a DressX app where you can order a digital fitted photo look, or you can try our fast fashion, a digital fast fashion, the uh, AR look, and you can try on straight away uh, on the photo, on the video with uh, AR camera and share it all across all uh, social networks straight away. So how do we contribute into the carbon emission? Uh, our research show that the production of the digital garment emits only 3% of the carbon footprint in comparison to the production of the physical garment. So if uh, our, our research also show that uh, about 9% of the uh, consumption of the buying of the clothes is bought just only for the content creation. So what we propose at DressX is that instead of buying a physical garments for uh, content creation for a social media, we propose a digital photo looks, uh, which will increase, which will decrease the carbon footprint from the fashion industry significantly. And if with the digital fashion we replace um, just only one percent of total physical. Uh, garments production, we will decrease the carbon footprint from the fashion industry of the same amount of the carbon footprint of Denmark in, uh, in every year. So our impact and our innovation as a digital fashion can actually contribute to make into, uh, into the movement of making fashion more sustainable. Thank you so much, Olga. Thank you. Saying all this. Um, so maybe Bobby, you can explain a little bit more about the um, automation for efficient production uh, using artificial intelligence, and that's what SizeMe does. Uh, you're the founder and CEO. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, please. First of all, thanks a lot for having me here. Yes, I'm Bobby. I am founder and CEO of SizeMe. Um, what we do is uh, providing an infrastructure for uh, demand-driven uh, manufacturing. Uh, essentially, what we do is connecting the uh, demand directly towards the production. And from a carbon emission perspective, uh, our goal and vision is to reduce the overproduction. Uh, we know that today, uh, a lot of the clothes that are being produced are never sold, or they're possibly sold, but to such a high discount that people just pick them up and actually never wear them. Um, we strongly believe that if we can have a shorter time between when people, for example, order a product and then it's being produced afterwards, or at least shorten the times between uh, when the demand happens and when the product is being uh, manufactured, that would help help quite a lot when it comes to reducing the carbon emission. And we work with uh, innovative brands that, that do want to look at their digital supply chain to shorten the cycle and be able to produce uh, everything from individual to individual customers uh, to small batches. Thank you so much. And finally, Lucas, you're the co-founder of Retrace. Uh, so Retrace is a platform for transparency as well uh, and sustainability management in the fashion industry. So you're really trying to visualize supply chain. Uh, could you give me more information about that? Absolutely. Thanks a lot for, for having us today. Yeah, as you said, my name is Lucas. I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of Retrace. And as you said, Retrace is all about transparency and sustainability management. Um, that means that we help brands to, first of all, understand uh, where their fashion items come from. So exploring the supply chain and then starting to collect as much data as possible in order to make sure that you get a full understanding of where your product is coming from and what kind of impact it has. Um, that means, for example, um, that we are working together then to connect you with your supply chain, get real data like electricity consumption, water consumption, chemical consumption, and, and waste, the material cutoff. And through that, you can start to calculate your CO2 footprint on product level. Um, and this, of course, allows you to get, first of all, a very good understanding where you currently are. And then, of course, we have the chance to compare you to your peers. So we can exactly show you on tier level 
how you perform uh, in comparison to others and thereby of course can directly show you potentially fields where you're doing a good job and of course improvement potential on other tiers where we can say hey look your t2 supplier in comparison to your peers is doing better is worse and this is probably the reason so this is a field where you can start to tackle in order to decrease your co2 footprint and um, i mean this is a very data driven approach but it has a lot um, to kind of give brands the right base to do the right decisions and understand where CO2 footprints are happening uh, and what you can do in order to decrease it over time. Thank you so much for this. Thank you again for, uh, for being here. So we're clearly here to discuss a little bit more about greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and you've discussed already how your company decreased the overall carbon emissions, but where do you see the biggest impact of fashion when it comes to carbon emissions? Um, Olga, if you want to start. Uh, well, I think that on each uh, stage of the production of the garment, there is um, a carbon emission and dependent on the type of the clothes or the type of the material, it, uh, it might be uh, accumulated on every stage. Depend yeah, if we use cotton, we, we use water, but maybe it's a little bit carbon footprint, then uh, the, uh, the transfer of the materials from one place to another, from one fabric to another, producing it and then transfer again. And then the sampling part, when you send samples uh, to, the uh, to the company who order them. So for me, it's on every stage where you accumulate your carbon footprint versus when you have the digital production, you don't have all this physical part of the production. We create everything uh, so we have just different nature of the carbon footprint our carbon footprint is coming from the electricity consumption because we use our computers and data centers uh, but because we have totally different approach and we don't use physical materials our carbon footprint is much lower and also what we are doing we are uh, uh, decreasing the time between the creating the samples, the uh, marketing uh, campaign, the sending all the garments all around the world. So, yeah, this is this is our approach. On oh, mute already. Thank you so much. And that's something that um, you could mention transportation as well, and really the uh, entire process. So maybe Lucas, can you jump on on that part? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, Olga is completely right. Uh, the whole production process in the fashion industry contributes to the overall CO2 footprint. Um, and I think, I mean, what we can see in the fashion industry is that the, the mass consumption or the overproduction is still taking place and probably it will remain the same over the next couple of years. So there need to be found ways in order to decrease the CO2 footprint on product level. Um, what we can see is that there are, of course, a couple of sources that contribute more to the CO2 footprint than others. I mean, the tier one suppliers always usually very much involved in the CO2 footprint calculation on the overall consumption. Of course, transportation, depending on the mode, um, if it's by ship or by train, it's significantly less than by airport or by, sorry, by plane. Um, and then of course you have the farming where also a big part of the CO2 footprint is actually created. Um, I mean, there's nothing much to do about that, but of course you can start to dig into each of these levels and you can see what you can do in order to improve it. Um, and there are, a lot of measures what you can do. I mean, you can start on the electricity source. You can, again, start on the mode of transportation. You can start on the materials that you actually choose. Um, and based on this, you can reduce your CO2 footprint over time. Um, if you ask me, though, what the perfect solution is, I mean, probably the consumption remains high. Um, and I guess we need to move to towards something like circularity in order to kind of overcome this, this issue of using too many materials and too many virgin materials. So you need to find a way to kind of close the loop and get the old materials back into the process. Um, but for this, obviously, you first of all need the collaboration of all different parties, um, which is a challenge because you first need to know who these parties are. And then, of course, you need to make sure that you have the right communication in order to understand, as a recycler, what materials have actually been used, which resources have been used, which kind of chemicals have been used that have been treated by the materials. And all of that is relevant in order to be able to actually close the loop and get a full understanding of of this kind of circular approach. Thank you so much. No, yeah, definitely. And that's something that we're actually trying to do a lot more at plug and play is really regroup everyone from different um, places of the industry, but also different markets. 
Uh, Bobby, you take a closer look at the post-industrial waste, trying to decrease that as much as possible by giving transparency in that part of that circularity. Uh, where would you think uh, carbon emission can be the most reduced? Well, I think both Olga and Lucas uh, mentioned overproduction, overconsumption. Um, the way we see it is uh, around 80%, uh, and I guess Lucas probably have all the breakdowns, but around 80% sits in the product itself, so in the production. So by um, reducing things that, where I would say the, the, the products that are never sold. So if we can start by eliminating that, that's sort of our goal um at least making sure that whatever is being whatever is being produced is also consumed uh, i'm sure that if we look at sort of a perfect solution yes it's a lot more uh, circular we we'll probably consume less um as consumers uh, but we believe that a starting point is uh, stop producing products that people don't want uh, and a large share of that is uh, a lot of the purchase or the production decisions are made uh too long in advance before the product is being bought. So there's too much bets and gamble, uh, which also results in, uh, unfortunately, too much are being produced that in the end goes to waste or never being worn. Thank you. And this brings another question and kind of jumping on the bet and gamble inside. You have all new innovation technologies and today a lot of these large corporations and even the consumer wonder, is that more sustainable than what we have today? Uh, there's a lot of conversation on how um, the energy consumption when it comes to um, blockchain, for example, to create that digital aspect. Uh, is definitely damaging in some ways. So how do we make sure our innovations stay more sustainable? So I guess I'm the first one. Address X, what we are doing since we are the pioneers in this field and one of the first companies who is doing the digital fashion, we consider ourselves also responsible for the sustainability part of the digital fashion. And my role is to trace all the environmental impact which we create uh, during the, our, our operations. And we look for the um, the solutions how to pollute less even we still were the least polluted part of the fashion industry we also have nft drops and this is a very controversial subject uh yeah because it's blockchain it, cons it uh, consumes a lot of energy but even with nft we have uh we conduct a study how we can do the NFT drops are more sustainable switching from the proof of stake proof of work to the proof of stake but behind every action we are doing as a digital fashion company we are doing the sustainability research and this is the first part and the second part to stay the carbon neutral we are actually working with the different uh, projects which are doing the carbon offset so all our activities are carbon uh, neutral and we are we want to show this as a blueprint to all other players who are entering digital fashion industry and so they will follow our lead and trace what they're doing uh, do the carbon offsets and find the ways and do the study how to eliminate uh, their impact with their innovations. Thank you so much. So really uh, guiding and having sustainability as the core of your growth as well. That's very exactly, true. exactly. We work with United Nations Alliance of Sustainable Fashion. They did the verification of our sustainability study. We work with Ellen MacArthur Foundation, with whom we also do the verification of uh, our calculations. So yeah, we are guiding uh, uh, the companies, the industry in this digital innovation uh, fashion. Thank you. And maybe Lucas, maybe you on that one, just because you do collect a lot of data uh, when it comes to uh, the entire transparent um, supply chain. Yeah, absolutely correct. And uh, I was also smiling because you used the word blockchain. So I directly uh, felt like uh, I, I need to respond here. I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, this whole topic is, is absolutely relevant. We're storing a lot of data and there's more and more data coming in. So we need to take that more serious the further we grow that how like in a way how we can store this data that we don't consume too much energy uh, and um, make sure that we kind of stay low on our on our overall impact level. Um, I can at least tell you here with regards to the blockchain. I mean, we had this question very much in the beginning on because we we saw ourselves or we see 
traceability as a core part of transparency. Therefore, we are collecting um, a lot of digital signatures along the supply chain to take all the transactions in, how products and raw materials have traveled through the supply chain. And we, for example, decided not to use a public blockchain, but a permission-based blockchain, because we saw that the consensus building in a public blockchain is much higher. Again, we all know the Bitcoin issues that we currently have with regards to energy consumption. And we said, okay, we use a, a permission-based blockchain only with the parties within a supply chain being part of the actual consensus building and ensuring thereby that, of course, the energy consumption is much, low, much lower. And in general, what we always try to do is, of course, have a good overview of where our impact actually comes from as a company. And of course, then have the right values to make sure that we then also follow through on this overview and understanding like, okay, hey, this is a huge part of our impact that we have. What can we do now to keep it low or to even decrease it over time? And I think this is, this is our job as a founder to guide here and to make sure that everyone in the company is following this lead. Excellent. Ravi, is there anything that you want to add? Well, I think maybe uh, from our perspective as well, uh, we think the sustainability is not a one-off thing. It's obviously it should be much more normalized. Everything you do should have go towards being more sustainable. Um, the way we look at it, if we can shift the system from today's to a, a more demand-driven system, we think we're doing a good thing. Uh, we, as a size me, uh, also trying to make sure that the process from uh, the demand all the way to the production floor is as automated as, as lean as possible. Um, that helps also brand to start looking at near shore production, uh, making sure that, I mean, in an ideal world, we would love to see recycled material produced locally for a consumer that already bought and, and want the product. And, and we're trying to build a system that allow for that direct link between the, the consumer and where the product's being produced. Uh, and of course, measuring the impact, trying to communicate that to our partners, see how, what impact would it have if they start shifting part of their uh, production volumes to a, a more demand-driven uh, compared to a mass, mass production model. Thank you, that's super helpful. Um, and so maybe taking a step away from um, the, the other impacts of uh, carbon emission in other ways. How do you see the digital space growing in the fashion industry? Well, for us, uh, for DressX, the answer is quite, uh, uh, quite easy because we are becoming the part of the fashion industry. We, we want people to start thinking about their uh, garments, not only imagine the physical wardrobe, but imagining the digital wardrobe. So when you think about your clothes, you, straight, you start to imagine straight away your digital and your physical wardrobe. And ideally, uh, you will keep your physical wardrobe to, uh, for its first initial purpose, to cover you, to protect you from the cold or from the sun. And if you want to express your uh, personality, you will use your digital wardrobe because we use uh, clothes, we use fashion, not only to protect ourselves from the weather or the other conditions, but also we use that to identify ourselves in, in, in the society. So we want people to think about digital fashion is the tool to identify themselves. And we are sure that in three, five years, every uh, physical, uh, physical retailer, every physical shop uh, will have the digital part. They'll have digital fashion just because there is a demand on that and people spend more and more time and creating their digital selves. So this is our vision of the fashion industry. Thank you. Bobby, Lucas. Um... Yeah, I think Olga already said it very nicely. I think what we can see in general in the fashion industry that um, I would say fashion companies start to understand that digitalization is a big help for them in order to, to transform their businesses, to become more profitable, to become more efficient, um, to make tasks easier. Um, we see that on the supply chain side. So obviously through digitization, you get a closer connection to your suppliers. You can exchange more data. And based on this data, you can make better decisions. Um, and obviously that's, that's a big help. Olga just explained it for her side uh, with regards to let's say product development and in general bringing go to, like, the go-to-market strategy for, for, for fashion brands. 
Um, and I think for this, it's beautiful to see how fashion companies have changed over the last, let's say, 12 to 24 months. Also, how, how COVID and the whole crisis helped companies to accelerate this, this shift towards more, uh, let's say, um, digital uh, product supply chains or general digital processes and operations. And, and I think being part of this change is, is beautiful because it's, uh, it's super exciting to see how companies, also with regards to their mindset, are shifting towards, towards this approach. Definitely. Yeah, maybe, maybe I jump in there as well. I mean, I can, uh, I find it super exciting what digital technologies can do. I mean, the fashion industry is traditionally very fragmented when it comes to a very long supply chain, a very fragmented production base. Uh, cross border makes it hard to, to track and trace. Um, and it's been really hard to to also digitalize where there's many steps that you need to look at to get sort of a end-to-end -end view of the uh, supply chain if you want to digitize that. But with the current technology and developments, there's so much you can do uh, that makes the whole supply chain more efficient, highlight uh, also inefficiencies, highlight or get the traceability uh, in place uh, and transparency and, and all of those things that help us take better decisions. Definitely. Thank you. And maybe one last question, and Bobby, we can start with you. Um, what would you ask the viewers, so startups and corporations, VCs, right now to promote the reduction of carbon emission, especially when it comes to uh, the fashion industry? Well, I, I would love that people at least trying to take a more holistic view. Um, there is a lot of sort of individual little uh, things that are being promoted. I would love for for everyone to be more aware of how the industry works. Um, I would love everyone that has a chance to make uh, better decisions uh, and also trying to move towards more sustainable. Uh, I think one thing that makes me personally very hopeful is we see a lot of our uh, partners. Um, we've gone from sustainability having been um, something that companies looked at to where stakeholders and key decision makers say it's important for me it's not only for the company I want to be part of a company that makes uh, the world a, a sort of a better place or at least reduce the harm that we do uh, and I think as to getting more and more people thinking uh, that they can contribute and especially when those those people are decision makers uh, I think that's it's, it's very promising yeah, I, I fully agree here to Bobby. I think everything he says is completely right. I just want to add one thing. Um, and I think sustainability is always, always a process. Um, we're never there. Um, but that's also a good thing because it means you can start very small and just kind of get it rolling. And I think if the mindset is right, if the people are all contributing, which we can see already, I think it's just kind of a moment where you should just push it and get the ball rolling and then step by step improve over time evaluate again see where you are next year and based on this drive further decisions to see that you can progress on your sustainability journey and i think then it's just a question of time until you reach a state where you say okay we're getting really somewhere and we can improve and, and can impact towards a better world thank you thank you olga yeah well uh i would agree with uh, both of the previous speakers with uh, bobby and lucas uh, and I would probably add, don't think about sustainability as it is, because there are so many things when we are talking about sustainability, but think also about how would you see, be responsible. Uh, think why do you want to create um, your business? What good and regenerative will do that for the economy, for the society, for the planet? And yes, stick to, stick to your ideas, stick to your guts, but also think about responsibility and regenerative uh, side of your business. Olga, Bobby, and Lucas, thank you so much again for the time today. Uh, it was very interesting, and I know I'm not the only one who uh, found that uh, very um, helpful. Thank you again, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you to Lucas, Olga, and Bobby for that incredibly insightful panel discussion and sharing the ways in which they're addressing that dichotomy between fashion lovers and their impact on the, on the environment. And so before we end today's event, I really wanted to share one more exciting announcement with you. We as Plug and Play Sustainability are expanding. So we're officially launching a new hub in Alberta with the Alberta government in the US and we are actually going to be launching a clean resources program launching in early 2020. So please stay tuned for some more announcements about that program. And also we have two new exciting partners that we're thrilled to announce. And these are Westlake and Astra. And for us, these really represent a tan some tangible evidence around that corporate commitment towards a carbon neutral future. And we're really excited about that. And so on that hopeful and exciting sentiment, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you for joining us today. And from me here in Johannesburg, where it is about 7 p.m., I'm going to say have a good evening and going to hand back over to Matt for some closing remarks. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's session. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you got a lot of great information, not only from the trends, but hearing about some of the amazing work that the startups have been working on over the last few years on helping different cities and corporations reach their different sustainability goals. And so before we end, I just want to leave you with one last message. If you're interested in getting involved or learning more about how we've been helping other organizations around the world reach their sustainability goals, please feel free to reach out to myself or a member of our team, or we will have a polls function um, pop up immediately after this and just go ahead and click on the yes. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us and a member of our team will reach out to you in the next week or so. And it's really one final message I want to give to everyone is we know it's difficult to become more sustainable in your businesses. It's a very difficult journey. We know there's a lot of hurdles um, that you have to overcome. And you know sometimes there's not always the perfect solution out there, but we really have to start looking at all the solutions that are out there if we're going to become more sustainable. All those solutions from A to Z. Thank you so much, everyone.